Um, Dr. Bradshaw, Carl asked, uh, how does dung build how does dung beetle management affect the fly populations? So, um, so the short answer is, um, you know, from 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 our work uh, with our uh, what we've done with dung beetles so far, you know, showing that um, rotational grazing can increase dung beetle diversity. An assumption would be that um, our pest pressure should be lower in those situations. However, we haven't actually done the studies here to, to show that functional relationship yet. Um, so I guess it, from my standpoint, in the work we've done so far, it pretty much exists as an assumption. There has been some other work that has been done to, that has showed um, a beneficial relationship between increased dung beetles or even increased abundance of certain dung beetle species uh, and reduction of, of fly-borne or of manure-borne uh, fly pests in particular. And a lot of that work has been primarily done uh, in South Africa and um, and a great deal has been done in, in some of the more uh, uh, wild, um, um, less managed situations. Okay, next question, uh, and that's also for you, Jeff. How do dung beetles affect carbon sequestration? Yeah, so uh, with our work so far, we're still analyzing um, the carbon, nitrogen, ammonia, and some of those other um, uh, soil properties and how the dung beetles have an effect on it. Um, we have seen uh, a reduction of some um, of some of those soil uh, nutrients, or rather we've seen an increase of some of those soil nutrients with the addition um uh, of dung beetles uh, into some of these uh, paths where we've done some exclusion studies, uh, doing comparisons of dung paths uh, where we've used screen to exclude dung beetles and paths that are open that have access to dung beetles. We've seen some of those differences. However, in some cases, we've actually seen an increase of some of the uh, nitrates in the soil uh, with the presence of, of dung beetles. And there's been some other work that's shown that as well. Um, and it, a lot of that has to do with um, with the dung beetles that are attracted, uh, whether you're getting more dweller type or more tunnelers or more rollers. Uh, and some of that interacts with the time of year that the cattle are out grazing as well. Um, since all these species have a different seasonality to them, um, uh, there's some changes to be expected with, there, with that. So... Um, don't really have a straight answer for you yet, and mostly because it's it's a fairly complex um, complex system. That's great. Um, so my next question to you, for also from Carl, is: uh, Are there any recommendations for pesticide reduction to encourage dung beetles on pastures? Uh, well. Um, <laughs> I feel like I'm giving you a lot of uh, hand-waving answers, Carl, but um, we don't have, I'm not, I, I feel comfortable with recommendations once we have uh, multiple studies uh, kind of coalescing around the same, forming some consensus. Uh, right now, there's been such little work uh, on dung beetles um, and pesticides uh, on rangeland or pastures. Um, particularly in our region, but you know, I know there's currently a lot of workers uh, in Mississippi, uh, in Kentucky, and other locations that are currently working on dung beetles. Um, there's, it's sort of a hot topic, if you will, at the moment. So hopefully in the next couple years, we can start to roll out some recommendations on what pesticides might be more compatible um, to perhaps encourage dung beetles. Um, another important factor with dung beetles is um, some soil types don't support their populations very well. Uh, some of the more glacial soils uh, in some of our northern climates, such as northern Minnesota, actually don't support dung beetle life cycles very well because of the soil types that are present. Uh, so, you know, we have the benefit in Nebraska and some other locations where we have uh, soil that's a bit more compatible to uh, help help some of these um, rollers and taller type dung beetles to complete their life cycle. Um, so, uh, you know, so again, coming back to recommendations, um, as we've found time and time again, it's going to rely on a lot of localized work being done 
to have some um, sound regional recommendations rather than you know something something that would be national. I don't think would be applicable. It's going to be have to be uh, more locally uh, derived information. That's great. And then the last question for you, Jeff, is uh, any impact on parasites when dung beetles are in the pasture? Yeah, so there's been some work um, uh, looking at the effect of uh, dung beetle diversity, and in some cases, just the abundance of certain species of dung beetles on reducing uh, nematode uh, levels, for example, um, when you're talking about parasites uh, in, in manure. And so there has been shown uh, that uh, adult dung beetles in particular, um, they do a fairly good job of, of lysing or breaking open uh, fly eggs that are present in uh, manure pats. Um, and some of the um, some of the nematodes, uh, their eggs or or some of their um, um, intermediate stages uh, in manure pats uh, can be affected, um, can be suppressed by the presence of of dung beetles and particularly certain species. Some of those. Uh, tunneler, the larger tunneler and uh, roller type species are p particularly effective um, in reducing some of those um, those parasite loads in, in manure pads. Dr. Dr. Tomlin, I'm doing work with uh, black soldier flies myself with uh, with horse manure, uh, and um, but the problem that we're having right now, uh, they don't seem to like the bedding like the carbon shavings and stuff. And so I'm wondering, A, do they like, are they more specific to a certain type of dung? And B, do you have any issues or any thoughts about um, they're, they're seeing, seeming to be a little resistant to too much carbon? So I, I guess knowing proportions would be really important. I, I would need to know what, she, what they mean by too much or, or too little. I, I will say this, that there are a lot of factors that are going to impact black soldier fly development. One's going to be moisture content, and I think with horse manure, that's a big issue. Uh, so somehow moisture needs to be increased a little bit. And I, I want to say that uh, also larval density is going to be critical. They can digest most material, including plant material, but it will depend on uh, what the larval concentration is, the moisture content, and probably a last factor is the... Um, texture of the, re the resource in question, not the manure as much as the bedding. So if the bedding is hot, solid and quite large, so the volume surface area is quite large or small, then it's a little more difficult for them to break it down. If it's uh, ground up, they can digest it a lot faster and a lot better. So it's a lot of factors that go into it. I'd, I'd have to see the manure. Um, you don't hear that every day. I, I'd have to see the manure and uh, get an idea of what its texture looks like and how you're, how you're actually working with it. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, and uh, Christina, Dr. Uh, Friesian, I think the last set of questions are for you. Again, uh, they're mostly from Carl. Carl asks, uh, he said, if there are too many filth flies in a given area, uh, is, that, does that in, is that indicative that something is out of balance perhaps? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, you know, one of the things I've really enjoyed um, is working with the different producers and seeing the different kind of setups that they have. And, it, you know, there's a real movement right now, um, especially with the organic facilities or even not necessarily organic, but just the smaller uh, facilities to kind of get more back to a uh, sustainable um practice. And so, you know, you see them trying to incorporate a lot of different uh, systems like rotational grazing and different animals following each other. And it seems like um, in some cases that that is effective. You know, I think it's something that needs to be looked at um, a little more closer um, through scientific lens, you know, of, of um, objectivity. Although, I mean, you know, you can understand that would be really hard given the different you know, everyone's a little bit different in how they do things. Um, but, you, you know, I think that filth flies are also just something that's, that's going to happen. You know, like in a pasture uh, setting, um, you know, it's, it'd be pretty hard to escape horn flies and filth flies no matter how many dung beetles you have. Um, so I think in some situations, the answer would be yes, it does indicate something is out of balance, but I think too in other situations, it's uh, just going to be there. 
Great, thanks. Uh, the next question for you uh, is also from Carl. It says, uh, flies do not like the fragrance of certain aromatic herbs such as elder, basil, lavender, mm -hmm. tansy, wormwood, rue, and mint. Uh, are any plantings done to help manage these fly populations? Yeah, and I also really like that question. Um, you know, one of the things that have come on the market to help with fly control, and I didn't mention it, um, were actually some sprays like geraniol um, and that sort of thing. The problem with the sprays, even though this is a little off the question, is that they tend to cost a lot when they use um, the essential oils, um, and they have a really short half-life as well. Um, but in terms of plantings, um, you know, it, it would be hard to imagine planting enough of those. You know, I love growing basil and lavender and all that anyway. It would just really be hard to overcome um, the attraction of the animal, you know, the stable fly or the, the horn fly to the animal, um, you know, despite them maybe being in an area where you would have those kinds of plants. And another thing to keep in mind, too, and I didn't talk about this, is all... Well, not the horn flies, but every fly that we talked about except the horn fly, um, they also feed on nectar. Uh, you can imagine, like, for a fly to fly through the air, I've heard it, um, uh, and, uh, is, um, sorry, kind of like, you know, swimming through a pool of molasses. You know, like the, the weight of the air is actually very heavy on a fly. And so to be able to do something like that is kind of an Olympic feat, and they need a lot of energy to do that, and that includes nectar feeding. Um, so I would, you know, be careful about what kinds of plants I plant too, because we know that they're nectar feeders. One of the things we don't know is what they're attracted to. Um, but it's a good question. I actually have a question in regards to that. I mean, uh, I don't know if the animals, if there's any nutritive value or if they're even harmful for the animals, but like the basil, lavender, wormwood, et cetera, et cetera, is it possible to plant things like that so that the animals can graze amongst them or in them, and then maybe it might get the bugs off a little bit? Yeah, that's actually another really good question, and it's not something that's really been, been looked at. Um, you know, I've heard of a couple of producers that are looking at feeding, like, garlic, you know, to their <laughs> to their animals, um, and maybe even you know, some other stuff that they think might be a fly repellent. And, you know, I, I think there's certainly... Um, you know, it's worth looking into. I guess all I can say is we don't we don't really know, you know, what effects that might have. Great, thank you. You have last question for you is how effective are fly predators? Right. <laughs> so those are those are the teramalids. Um, yeah, there's a real heavy push on producers to to apply these. There's a lot of um, testimonials saying how wonderfully um, effective they are. Um, and I think in some situations they might be effective, but the science, um, for the most part, doesn't really back it up. I think what most people don't realize is that you already have a natural population of fly predators before you even buy some and put them out into the field. Um, and, you know, these teramalids, um, there's different species of them, and just like there are different species of animals, they all need... Um, or thrive in a certain kind of environment or habitat. And uh, when you buy a big bag of um, fly predators, it's not necessarily the kind that thrive the best in your environment, but they're the ones that, um, you know, they're able to commercially uh, rear and produce. And so you're not always getting, you know, what would be most effective for your area anyway. Um, so I, in some cases, um, you know, it might be effective, but... You know, for those reasons, I think the science has kind of shown that it's um, not really worth it.